All right, welcome everyone. Uh, we'd like you to take your seats so we can get started. I'd like to start by thanking everyone for being here. This is a Federalist Society event, and for those who don't know, the Federalist Society is a conservative and libertarian, nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, and we stand for judicial restraint and the rule of law. Uh, in terms of scheduling today, first we'll have our GW Law Professor Renee Lerner will provide some opening remarks about Title IX generally and the role of Congress in the implementation of Title IX. And then we have our two speakers. We have Mr. Stuart Taylor here and Professor Wendy Murphy, who due to a last minute flight issue was unable to be here in person, but we are very appreciative that she was willing to Skype with us. So she will, continue, she will contribute via Skype, as you can see, uh, for her presentation. And our panelists have very impressive backgrounds on this issue of Title IX. We appreciate them being here tremendously. Uh, Mr. Taylor is a journalist who has authored many pieces on these issues, and he writes about legal issues and political issues before the Supreme Court. Professor Murphy is an adjunct professor of sexual violence at the New England Law School in Boston. She's known as the goddaughter of Title IX, and she also wrote the first law review article that describes the legal relationship between sexual assault on campus and Title IX. So I will begin with Professor Lerner. I commend the Federal Society for putting on this event, and especially uh, for arranging the Skype uh, with uh, Professor Murphy. And Professor Murphy, thank you for being here virtually. We very much appreciate it. Good to um, be here. Well, Title IX is everywhere these days. Uh, on Monday, I got in my inbox an email advertising a program called Title IX Boot Camp for Colleges and Universities. Uh, for $999, you can participate in a four-part webinar. Uh, the titles of whose sessions are The Roles and Responsibilities of the Title IX Coordinator, Protect Your Students and Your School by Understanding the Many Requirements, Title IX and Athletics, Requirements Concerning Pregnant and Parenting Students, and Title IX and Sexual Violence on Campus. This morning, I found in my mailbox the latest issue of the Journal of Legal Education, which contains a large uh, group of articles uh, entitled Sexual Misconduct, Title IX, and Academic Policies. So Title IX has clearly uh, become involved in many, many areas. And a question I'd like to address very briefly is what is Title IX? this provision that has ramified in so many different directions. It was enacted in 1972, and in relevant part, it states, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. That is the text uh, the, re of the relevant part of Title IX. In the congressional hearings, there was very little mention of athletics and no mention of sexual assault. The hearings focused on universities' practices of hiring and employment. Soon, as you're aware, uh, Title IX was interpreted to have a major effect on college athletics. Over the course of the 1990s, the Department of Education showed an interest in a connection between Title IX and sexual assault. Now, during that decade, an important change occurred in sexual behavior on campus. And I think it's possible that many students don't fully understand the impact of that. I graduated in 1990 from college. My youngest brother graduated in 1999. We attended the same college. I couldn't believe the stories he was telling me about sex among students. Between the time I went to college and the time he did, there arrived the hookup culture. The hookup culture, with its vastly increased promiscuity, has led to, on the part of women students, 
especially, a great deal of anxiety and pain. Into this cultural change came the Obama administration's 2011 Dear Colleague letter issued by the Department of Education. And that letter set out some standards respecting uh, sexual assault investigations. It required a standard of preponderance of the evidence, and many colleges had been using a standard of clear and convincing evidence before that. It made it very difficult, essentially prohibited, the accused from questioning the accuser or other witnesses against him. It encouraged Title IX investigators to look for inculpatory evidence and not exculpatory. Well, as any lawyer or law student should be able to predict, such procedures were likely to result in miscarriages of justice. And that is what happened. And uh, as Stuart Taylor describes uh, some of these in his book, Last month, the Department of Education rescinded the 2011 Dear Colleague letter. And in its latest interim guidance, the department allows universities to use the standard of clear and convincing evidence and encourages investigators to look for exculpatory as well as inculpatory evidence. The department says that it will engage in notice and comment rulemaking before providing more permanent guidance. Here at GW, since the summer of 2016, the Department of Education has been investigating the university for its handling of sexual assault cases. The university says that it is reevaluating its handling of the Title IX procedures. In the wake of the Department of Education's latest guidance, President LeBanc has stated that GW will continue to use the standard of preponderance of the evidence. I am very much looking forward to this debate, and in particular, to see where are the areas of disagreement between uh, Professor Murphy and Mr. Taylor, and where are the areas of agreement, because I suspect we might find some, and I'm looking forward to seeing what those are. And with that, I will turn it over to our debaters. Thanks very much. I hope everyone can hear me OK. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd like especially to thank uh, the people sponsoring this debate, the Federalist Society, Allison Shepard Dack, did I get that right, uh, and, and Professor Lerner. And I'd like to um, thank Wendy Murphy for being willing to debate me, because uh, most people on her side of the argument don't debate. They denounce. And uh, so I'll start. Which, <laughs> there I go. Since this discussion is titled Statutory Authority in Sexual Assault, I begin by noting that there was no statutory authority for the Obama administration's demands starting in 2011 that thousands of colleges and universities around the country adopt detailed rules effectively presuming the guilt of all students accused of sexual assault. And of course, about 99% of those students are male. The mandates are that thousands of colleges and universities, I'm sorry, I covered that. These mandates, which Congress has never endorsed, have helped destroy any pretense of fairness or due process in campus sex proceedings. They represent bureaucratic tyranny run amok. Title IX, the 1972 law that the Obama administration claimed was the statutory basis for its campus sexual assault mandates, said nothing at all about sexual assault. As Professor Lerner indicated, all Title IX did was to make it illegal for schools that receive federal money to practice sex discrimination. In 1992, Congress adopted another law of some uh, relevance, a vague provision requiring universities to develop policy statements aimed at preventing sex offenses and develop procedures for once a sex offense has occurred. But that was pretty vague. And since then, Congress has largely left alleged campus sexual assaults to the executive branch regulatory process. The members of Congress who adopted these two laws 
would have been flabbergasted had they been told that, starting with the now infamous April 2011 Dear Colleague letter issued by the Obama administration, the Federal Department of Education would do the following things, rather than leaving allegations of sexual assault to law enforcement, as in the past. Professor Lerner has touched on some of these Obama mandates that I will mention. Uh, the administration told colleges to hire thousands of sex bureaucrats, Title IX coordinators is one word for them, uh, to handle and to increase, that was the clear purpose, uh, the number of claims of sexual assault by women on campus. Uh, it gave colleges power to brand a student a rapist, and it required them to train these sex bureaucrats, which typically involves making false claims to them indoctrinating them in the view that almost all accused males are guilty and that accusers should be believed even if their stories are littered with contradictions based on junk science that the great journalist Emily Yaffe exposed recently in the Atlantic magazine. The administration required guilt-presuming anti-due process, anti-male procedures in all disciplinary matters involving sex. It ordered that accused students be found guilty even when the evidence is almost as consistent with innocence as with guilt. It virtually banned cross-examination and other processes to test whether accusers are telling the truth. It required that accused students who are found innocent be subject, subjected to appeals by accusers, amounting to a form of double jeopardy. It pushed schools to appoint a single bureaucrat to act as investigator, prosecutor, judge, and jury. It didn't order them to do that. It, it urged them to do it. And in general, it created an atmosphere of, of fear among people on campuses, among the people running the campuses, uh, that if they didn't hammer a lot more alleged uh, sex offenders, uh, the Education Department would take away their federal money. The Obama administration could have gone through the process required by the Administrative Procedure Act for enforcing regulations to, adopting regulations to enforce Title IX. It's called notice and comment rulemaking. It's what Betsy DeVos is doing now, to her credit, to provide for federal intervention in the very limited class of cases in which schools have condoned pervasive student-on-student -student sexual assaults. Anything going much further than that would have uh, probably violated the Supreme Court's decision in the Davis versus Monroe County case. But President Obama and his appointees wanted a far broader regulatory regime. And they were in such a rush to increase the chance of guilty finding that they simply imposed their new mandates by decree with no public notice and no comment period. The Obama team also threatened to cripple any school that did not obey its orders by taking away its federal money. The administration called these mandates guidance, quotes, on its far-fetched interpretations of Title IX. Respected experts call them gross violations of the Administrative Procedure Act, not to mention some other laws. So much for statutory authority, or the lack thereof. Now for an overview of the damage that the Obama administration and its ideologically fevered allies on and off campus have done since 2011. One memorable characterization came in 2014 from Harvard Law Professor Elizabeth Bartholet, Director of Harvard's Child Advocacy Program. She said, quote, our society will look back on this time as a moment of madness, end quote. She was one of 28 Harvard Law Professors, which is a lot, who signed a forceful statement in 2015, I think it was, denouncing the Obama mandates and denouncing Harvard's capitulation to them. And they also carved out a separate regime for Harvard Law School, which is more fair than anywhere else. These rules have been branded as sexual predators, railroaded out of college, and in some cases ruined the lives of scores, perhaps hundreds, of accused young men who were, in fact, innocent of any crime. It's hard to pin down the numbers for reasons I can give, but we have about 40 cases that meet that description in our book. And in many and probably most of these cases, no conduct that would violate criminal law or even violate any reasonable definition of sexual harassment is even alleged, much less proved. It's, not, it's often not he said, she said. It's both of them said, yeah, we got drunk and had sex. And then the college says to the guy, you're kicked out. 
Guys are being punished even when the only complaint is that they both were drunk or she later had regrets. This is not to deny that rape and lesser sexual assaults are a serious problem on campuses, as they have been worldwide throughout human history. But contrary to current media mythology, the best federal data show that America's campuses may be among the safest places in the world for young women. In fact, the number of assaults had plunged, according to Bureau of Justice Statistics, between 1997 and 2011 by about half. The data also show that young women on campus, college campuses have been in far less danger of being victimized than those who did not go to college, as in many criminal matters, uh, the, the people most victimized are the people in the lowest income categories. Ironically, the Obama policy may well have made campuses less safe for college women for two reasons. First, the worst that a college can do to a real rapist is expel him, which will not prevent him from raping other women at other colleges or elsewhere. Second, the campus kangaroo courts are becoming so discredited that their decisions are already being viewed by great skepticism by increasing numbers of people, including judges. We've seen more than 60 cases, my co-author Casey Johnson tabulates them, uh, in which colleges have lost uh, important decisions, usually on preliminary motions, but then they settle the case because they know they're likely to lose the case itself. Um, The skepticism inevitably sp spills over, skepticism about the college system inevitably spills over into skepticism about the claims of real victims, as well as false accusers. The Obama administration's energetic lawmaking in this realm took off after the president, seeking to recover politically from congressional Democrats' disastrous drubbing in the 2010 elections, took a series of aggressive executive actions to fire up his most passionate supporters in areas including immigration and others, but especially including campus sex. The, the Obama base included gender warriors who call themselves feminists. I call them gender warriors because I, I respect feminists who I regard as honest feminists and who are in favor of equality. That's not what the people I'm talking about do. Uh, they have for decades been spreading the myths, gender warriors, that the nation's colleges are in the grip of a rape culture characterized by hostility or indifference to victims. There is no rape culture, although colleges probably were not very vigilant for victims if you go back to say the 70s or the 80s, and some still aren't if we're talking about big money athletes being the accused. But by and large, there is no rape culture. There is a presumption of guilt culture. Based on phony statistics, as well as distortions of Title IX, the Obama administration launched a campaign to change campus disciplinary rules in ways designed to expel or suspend many more accused males without much attention to whether they were guilty or innocent. Aggravating the impact of the Obama-mandated procedures is that many universities have weakened due process protections even more than the Obama Office of Civil Rights explicitly required. They did this in part to win favor with the Obama team and in part uh, for ideological reasons. Uh, and campus rape activists are very powerful. Uh, the professors and many of the administrators are afraid of them. Many, if not most, universities bar accused students' lawyers, if any, from participating in campus proceedings. They deny accused students timely access to the specific allegations and evidence to be used against them and even to exculpatory evidence in the university's hands. They limit accused students' abilities to call witnesses to testify. They deny them any right to an impartial panel or decision maker. And they put their fates in the hands of extremely biased campus sex bureaucrats who need to appease federal sex bureaucrats, or at least did under the Obama administration, to keep their jobs. At the same time, universities' definitions of sexual assault have stretched enormously, in the words of Harvard Law professors Jacob Gerson and Jeannie Suk Gerson. Indeed, they wrote, the, concepts, the concept of sexual misconduct has grown to include most voluntary 
and willing sexual conduct. That's a quote. Crazy? Yes. That's what our universities have come to, or many of them, maybe not this one. And Congress has had very little say about it, going back to the statutory basis, other than democratic denunciations, unanimous among those who have spoken out, uh, of Betsy DeVos's efforts to make campuses more fair to accused students as well as accusers. Thank you. I look forward to hearing Wendy Murphy. Shall I just, shall I start? Sure. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, so glad to be here. I'm sorry I'm not there in person. Your gorgeous moot courtroom um, is, is beautiful. I wish I could be there and meet all of you. I, I hope to someday. Uh, thanks to the Federalist Society, um, Professor Lerner, Mr. Taylor, I'm glad to hear your comments. Um, I do think we have common ground and you may be surprised, Mr. Taylor, to hear what I think it is. I suspect you won't agree with me, but I hope you do. Um, first, let me say, just in response to a couple of things that Mr. Taylor said, um, you know, 40 cases of men being poorly treated on campus or not receiving the kind of fair treatment to which they were entitled is unacceptable. But let's contrast that with the 60,000 sexual assaults a year that occur in universities and colleges ac across the country, almost all of those not subjected to civil rights redress on college campuses, which is a grotesque injustice because all violence against women is a civil rights matter and must be subjected to civil rights response and redress on campus. Nearly all of those 60,000 are denied access to fair justice. Does that mean they're all telling the truth? No, but that's not the issue. It's whether we are framing and naming violence against women, which always includes sexual assault, as a civil rights injury, fully entitled to equal treatment under civil rights laws on par with race and national origin. That's what civil rights laws say under statutory law. I wanna talk very quickly about due process because I do think here's where our common ground is, Mr. Taylor. Um, though it's not correct that students are entitled to due process in college because the Supreme Court has not ruled that there is a constitutional right to remain in college. There's no liberty interest, no protected liberty interest. There is a Supreme Court case on point that speaks to uh, due process rights in the K-12 educational environment and in the context of um, a case where state law granted a constitutional right to remain in college. I still believe, no matter what the Supreme Court has said about that, that there should be due process for students who are subjected to serious punishments uh, by universities. There should be due process, but there isn't. And if there were, it would nonetheless have to give way to the mandates of federal civil rights laws. It could not crush the mandates especially the mandate of equitable treatment of victims that is statutorily required under federal civil rights laws. I'd like to emphasize at this point that the Betsy DeVos guidance, um, and, in, and in some of her comments, she speaks a lot about the importance of due process. Here's what I'd like to clarify. She only asks for due process for situations where men are beating and raping women. She did not ask for due process for other types of civil rights offenses, as when white supremacists beat up black students or anti-Semitic students beat up Jewish students. When the Department of Education wants due process only for men who beat and rape women, that is not due process. That is subjugation of women masquerading as due process. It is not a sincere concern for due process. I'll point out that in Indiana in 2015, a man was accused on campus of beating a Muslim woman. Um, he was expelled in three days flat. No, due, no, not only no due process, he got nothing. No chance to challenge evidence, nothing and three days he was gone. 
because he was subjected to civil rights response and redress in that Deanna University campus environment. And not one of the professors at Harvard who claims to care about due process, and not even Mr. Taylor, spoke up for that guy. Three days flat, he was gone, lost his college education, lost everything. We don't even know if he actually did it because you can't have a fair process in three days. Um, okay, if I could move to my slides now, I'd really like to start by emphasizing that my greatest concern here is the very confusing collapse of civil rights laws with generic, far less important student misconduct codes. They could not be more different. They are different in definition. They are different in terms of what's mandated versus not mandated by federal law. And they serve very different interests. Federal civil rights laws create legal injury not only in the individual victim who suffers the harm because of who they are in society, but they create harm in the class of people affected and the community at large. Why is it important to always frame civil rights injuries as civil rights injuries? Because then we all become invested in solutions because we all feel injured. It's why I feel injured when racist violence happens on college campuses, and I am not black. I feel injured, which inspires me to become invested in solutions. Women have never been granted that basic dignity that civil rights laws provide statutorily, and they are entitled to it. The disparate treatment of sex-based harms is the key problem and the Betsy DeVos new guidelines perpetuate and exacerbate the problem. I'm going to go very quickly through my slides because some of them are super long. I'm leaving the slides for you to look at further later, um, but the timeline is important. I was glad to hear a little bit of the timeline at the beginning. There's a, even more to it. There's a lot of political um, activity in the timeline that requires more time than this event today uh, provides to discuss and explain. But suffice it to say that an awful lot of litigation activity and um, frankly, uh, politicizing of the regulations and the sub-regulatory guidance began when schools fell subject to liability, not surprisingly. Schools fell subject to liability in 1999, what followed thereafter, and it remains to this day, was a lot of um, regulatory, statutory, sub-regulatory, and just outright litigation around um, how to minimize schools' exposure for what was and remains today uh, a very substantial problem of sex-based harms on college campuses Sex-based harms are by far the most common type of civil rights injury on college campuses compared to all the other civil rights offenses combined. It is by far the most severe and prevalent form of harm. So of course schools are concerned about not, well, not necessarily unconcerned about reducing incidence rates, but they're also concerned about public perception that schools are unsafe places for women and girls. They are, they are unsafe places and they shouldn't be. This timeline tracks in particular the activities um, once it became clear that Title IX covers sex-based harms in the form of sexual assault and sexual violence. I'm frustrated as a feminist, as an activist, that it took from 1972 to 2011 for the public to understand that violence based on sex would be covered by civil rights laws. We got that point real clear when even back in 1964, when the first Civil Rights Act was enacted, well, not the first, but when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was enacted and um, black kids in the South started going to integrated schools, 
What, what happened when they went to school is they were accompanied by federal officials with guns because there was a fear of violence. We understood intensely and in, innately that violence is not only a civil rights problem, it is the most severe expression of discrimination. We only didn't understand it as applied to women. And it was propaganda around the idea of Title IX as a sports equity rule that kept us in the dark for so long. That is unacceptable. And we are right now in the process of making up for that. Decades of propagandized distraction, distraction strategies. Women aren't entitled to protection from violence. They're entitled to equal distribution of basketballs. Imagine if we had said that to any other class of people during the civil rights era. Here, you're entitled to civil rights protections and education. Here, to this group of black children, you're entitled to civil rights protections and education. Here's your own uh, basketball team. Here's your own, uh, you know, here's some extra money for, for hockey sticks. Who would have tolerated such an insult? Who would have tolerated that? Women tolerated it because we were propagandized to look elsewhere for what civil rights means for us. This slide, I think, just states the obvious. Most of you know, these are the three key civil rights laws, uh, Title IX, Title IV, and Title VI. What I want to emphasize here is that we talk a lot about Title IX, which is an amendment to the education amendments, um, but no less a civil rights law. But women are also protected under Title IV of the Civil Rights Act, where sex is listed exactly on par with race and national origin. Title IV covers public schools. Title IX covers recipients of public funds. Title IV covers public schools, which, is, which raises an interesting question about the DeVos guidelines. Um, you know, she can say what she wants about, about Title IX. She has the right to make interpretations within reason and to issue those guidelines based on her idea about what the laws mean. But she can't subvert Title IV. Title IV exactly equates sex, race, and national origin. And to the extent she has now subjected sex to different treatment, she may well be acting in violation of Title IV, at least as her guidance applies uh, to public schools. I won't go through the details here. Obviously, we've covered what sexual discrimination is. It comes in different labels. Some people call it sexual harassment when it, when it covers uh, a certain type of unwelcome and offensive conduct. The bottom line is it's all a form of sex discrimination. It's all covered by civil rights laws. A single act is obviously enough. This goes for based on race, sex, national origin cases, a single act is enough because why? Because a severe punch in the face to a black man or to a woman or to a Jewish or a Muslim student, if it's done on the basis of a protected class category is obviously an act of discrimination. Why? Because if you just use a racial or a gender or a national origin ethnic epithet and you don't punch somebody in the face, that implicates civil rights laws too. Not necessarily a violation to do it once with a single phrase, but if it implicates civil rights laws to use a racial epithet, then of course it implicates civil rights laws to also punch someone in the face or sexually violate them while using the racial epithet or the sexual epithet at the same time. These are key to our assessment of what DeVos has done. Because in her guidelines, some, not all, explicitly violate the current Title IX regulations. Now, I know that she has announced that she, she is asking for comments. There's no, now a notice and comment period underway where people will be able to speak to her about what they think the new rules and regulations ought to be. But for now, she is clearly acting in violation of at least some of the existing regulations. For example, and this isn't all of them, I'm just giving you a, uh, some, and I've highlighted critical pieces. I've touched on this already. 
The Title IX regulations forbid explicitly the treatment of any person in a way that is different from another. Different treatment with regard to the provision of aid, benefits, services. And I've, I've highlighted as well with an asterisk, an asterisk, because I think this particularly applies to the sexual assault issue, a school shall not subject any person to separate or different rules of behavior, sanctions, or other treatment. Think about that. Betsy DeVos has announced that only sex-based harms will be subjected to her new guidance. That is explicitly separate and different rules of behavior, sanctions, or treatment, illegal under the current regulations. Uh, Professor Murphy? Yes. Uh, we would like to have some time for rebuttals on the part of both you and Mr. Taylor and also questions from the audience. Uh, okay, sorry. Did, I'm sorry if I went too far. I wasn't watching the clock. Uh, would you like to wrap up? Yes, thank you. I'm not going to go through any more of these except to say that they're all in the slides and available to you. Um, I'll go to, to, the, to these two, which I think are critical to the question of congressional power. What can the Department of Education do? What can they legally do? They can investigate, prosecute, hold hearings. They can issue, rescind subregulatory rules, guidance on compliance without even following the notice and comment rulemaking, but only as to interpretive rules and general policy statements. What can they not do? They cannot change Title IX or the substantive Title IX regulations. And even when regulations are promulgated after the notice and comment period, they cannot be sustained and no court will uphold them if they are arbitrary, capricious, and abuse of discretion or not in accordance with law. I think this is gonna be particularly problematic for DeVos if she codifies her guidance by making them into regulations in states where state constitutional guarantees offer better protections than federal law for sex, gender, equality. That's the final thing. I'll, I'll leave my summarized um, slide up, but that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Taylor, do you have uh, some comments? <clears throat> a few points. Um, first, I think pervading Professor Murphy's talk was a confusion about what Title IX does. Title IX does not, yes, sexual violence can be sex discrimination. Title IX does not punish sex discrimination by students. It punishes, it forbids sex discrimination by universities. And if some student somewhere on a campus commits a sexual offense and it happens, uh, it's not really a, an occasion for regulating what the university does, although the Office of Civil Rights has made it such. Title IX does not make it such. Second, she estimates 60,000 sexual assaults per year on campuses. That is a wild exaggeration. The best federal statistics, the Clary Act reports, uh, show that campuses report about 5,000 a year, not 60,000. And by the way, campuses are subject to penalties if they don't report everyone that comes to them. Second, the idea that students should have due process, uh, good, I, I like that. But <laughs> Professor Murphy's claim that students are not legally entitled to due process is utterly unsupportable. No court has ever, well, some courts have said something like that. The Supreme Court has not spoken to the issue, but dozens of judges have held that, yes, they're entitled to due process, or in a case of a private college that's not covered by the Constitution to something equivalent to it as a contractual matter. Um, and two federal courts of appeals uh, have reached the same question, including the second, a Second Circuit panel uh, of which all three judges were Democratic appointees. The idea that due process must give way to civil rights laws is absolutely backwards. Uh, it's elementary. You should learn in your first year at law school that the Constitution trumps the statute no matter what the statute says. Due process comes from the Constitution. Again, you may have a separate rule in a private school. Uh, the criticism of Secretary DeVos for her admirable uh, statements on this, and by the way, I don't say that as an admirer of Trump. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm very much a detractor of Trump. Uh, but what DeVos has said on this and done so far is admirable. The idea that, gee, she's not saying anything about violence against black students or whatever, I mean, that's just out of left field. 
I haven't heard anybody anywhere say, oh, the problem with DeVos is she's only talking about the sex stuff. That's the thing there's a big debate about. You know, she didn't talk about, uh, you know, female genital, genital mutilation in Africa either. You can't fault her for not talking about everything that's going on in the world. Uh, civil rights laws. No civil rights law requires colleges to discriminate against students accused of sexual assault, which is what's been done. Uh, widely, including mandated by the administration, the Obama administration. Um, back to DeVos for a moment, even liberal newspapers that have been very much uh, uh, fanning in my, distorting in my view, uh, the amount of sexual violence, uh, applauded uh, DeVos's statements. They include the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, and USA Today. And the kinds of criticisms of DeVos that, uh, that Professor Mercy has made are, are not to be found in those, in those newspapers. Uh, schools being unsafe places for women and girls. I don't know of any parent anywhere who's decided that her girl, their children, will not go to college because they wouldn't be safe. Uh, they are safer in college than they would be if they were not in college. Yes, young women have a higher rate of being raped and sexually assaulted, but young women out of college, again, the federal statistics show, are in more danger than young women in college. Title IV, that comes out of left field. I, I don't know of anybody who's ever suggested until I just heard it that Title IV has much to say about this. And the idea that uh, Title IX regulations forbid differential treatment, they, were, they forbid discrimination. You know. Have you noticed that there are no women on the football team at most colleges? That's differential treatment. Not many people have suggested that it violates Title IX. I'll stop there. All right, Professor Murphy, do you have any response? It would have to be brief. Yeah, yeah, just a couple things. So, you know, sports are separately um, uh, regulated and uh, subject to different rules, so that doesn't really apply. I'm putting up this slide right now that specifically forbids different treatment, not just discrimination, but different treatment that's been in the regulations since 1975. Um, there are some judges who have, at the lower court level, not the United States Supreme Court level, that have um, talked about the concept of due process, generally speaking, arising out of a contract relationship between offender students and, uh, and a university. One notable judge in, in Massachusetts uh, wrote something uh, like that in what's known as the Brandeis decision, Judge uh, Dennis Saylor, what people forget, they cite it all the time. I, I know Stewart cites the case all the time. The Judge Saylor decision is notable for its complete lack of mention of Title IX. In fact, there's a footnote in the decision that says there is no Title IX claim here. It was dropped prior to the court issuing its decision. In other words, it's just a generic assessment of whether someone committed of a non-civil rights infraction or found responsible for a non-civil rights infraction uh, is entitled to some degree of due process when the school promises to provide due process. This is not a constitutional form of due process at all. And until the United States Supreme Court says that students have a constitutional due process right to remain in college, it is a red herring to talk about due process. Obviously, people with a mandatory right to civil rights protections on college campuses have priority legal seating in this debate. Um, the only other thing I would say is Stuart mentioned, uh, you know, <laughs> that the students accused of committing these offenses are the ones suffering civil rights violations. I've read the civil rights laws many, many, many times. Thus far, being accused of an offense is not a protected class category. And let's be clear, the accuser in these cases is not the victim. It is the school. It is the school that is mandated to redress these matters. They are the accuser. The victim is but a witness of her own suffering. And let's be clear about one final thing. It's not that the schools have to discriminate in order to be held accountable under civil rights laws. Look at the top paragraph in this slide. The school is mandated to provide prompt and equitable grievance procedures to redress any a complaint about any action which would be prohibited by Title IX. In other words, it is the action 
that is covered by civil rights laws. It is the action that is defined as a civil rights offense. And it is the school's obligation to treat it as such. So the parsing of words about is the school discriminating, is the, is the offender discriminating? The point is violence against a person on a college campus because of who they are in society is a civil rights matter that must be, must be addressed under civil rights laws. There is no discretion. <coughs> Thank you, Professor Murphy. I am going to uh, exercise the privilege of the moderator here and ask a question. And after that, I will open it up uh, to the audience for questions. Uh, my question is this, for both of you, uh, I have two daughters. In due course, I assume they will go off to college. Uh, when they go to college, I plan to give them some advice. If you are raped, I will tell them, go to the police. Rape is too serious a crime to be left to university administrators. If someone has committed rape, that person should be behind bars and not out on the street. Is this advice sound or unsound? And why? I, I agree with the advice. I have two daughters, too. And uh, that would have been my advice to them if we were talking about this sort of thing when they were in college. Um, and, uh, and I think the campus systems have demonstrated they're incompetent as well as discriminatory. And it really serves uh, real victims of rape uh, badly, as well as uh, people falsely accused of rape. If I had a son going to college, Given what's happened so far, if the status quo continues, I would say you should think very seriously about never dating any woman at your college. Because if you date a woman at your college and she someday gets mad at you or decides she needs an excuse because she was cheating on her boyfriend, et cetera, et cetera, and reports you for drunken sex or whatever, you're cooked. Okay. Uh, by dating, do you mean having sex? We're in a different world now. Well, <laughs> it's, it's a very good question. Um, uh, you know, uh, college rules uh, uh, penalize, let's say, uh, unwanted touching, which could be construed to include close dancing. They penalize uh, forced kissing, which includes you know, can include any unwanted kiss. So uh, I'd say dating <laughs> and not just right. exclusively sex. Okay, uh, Professor Murphy? Uh, I, I agree in part. I mean, what I teach um, anyone who's injured on campus by uh, sex-based harm, which is physical violence, you know, stalking, dating abuse, sexual assault, I say call 911 immediately. Don't just call the police, call 911. You wanna make a public record of it and report it to all university officials from the president on down in writing in an email. Because what I'm worried about if we teach people only to call police is that we're gonna create invisibility on campus for the purpose of assessing um, what happens on campuses through campus statistical data gathering. Um, I, you know, I think the, the invisibility problem is created in part by all these various crazy ways we measure problems on campus and in the real world. Um, and, you know, reporting is important, even if someone is never prosecuted, even if the school never takes any kind of action, it should at least be counted somehow to prevent this systemic invisibility problem. The other thing I want to say about the 60,000 number, I've I think I've got distributed for everyone in the audience um, a recent Law Review article I published, a review of Jonathan Krakauer's horrific book, uh, Missoula, um, in which I cite the data that establishes 60,000 a year as the number of sexual assaults on college campuses, and it's probably a very low number. I cite the data. You know, data is a funny thing. People can come up with all kinds of reasons why one study is better or worse methodologically than another. But I personally think 60,000 is a low estimate. What I do know is that a woman who joins the military is less likely to be sexually assaulted in that very hyper-masculine environment. Um, and I know this from anecdotal evidence in my own work. I've been doing Title IX work since the early 90s. The majority of my cases, the victims weren't confused. They didn't regret they didn't change their mind. They were disproportionately drugged, drugged 
not drunk, drugged. Thank you. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Yes. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> thank, thank you both for, uh, for speaking. I think that you don't hear discussions from two people of the opposite view of this very often. This is to uh, both of you, but especially Professor Murphy. Is you, you brought the case of the, like, I think it was Indiana University, the person being expelled in, in three days. In generally, like conceptually, should there be a presumption of innocence when someone's accused of a crime and specifically a sexual assault crime? Okay. Well, I wouldn't call it a presumption of innocence. That's a criminal law concept, and we have to be very careful to keep criminal law language, definitions, terminology, and procedures. The whole vibe of criminal law should be out of the campus environment. The campuses are not the government. They're not prosecuting people. We need to use civil rights language and terminology. So if your question is, should something happen to that person before a determination is made that they in fact did it? No. Obviously, there should be some process in place to make sure that there is confidence in the decision uh, that's made, that this did happen and that some kind of sanction is appropriate. I don't think every sexual assault should lead to expulsion. I think that's ridiculous. But there has to be something done in response to every civil rights based offense because the law mandates it and because it's critically important to maintain the integrity, the special integrity of our universities as places where equality and equal access are predominant values. Uh, yes, it's vital that there be a, a presumption of innocence. And in fact, in a sense there is because proof by a preponderance of the evidence in order to find someone guilty means that Unless you have proof by a preponderance of the evidence, he's not going to be found guilty. In civil litigation, put aside the criminal process for the moment, you have to prove your case. If a woman sues a man for rape, she has to prove that he raped her. He is presumed innocent, and that's a fairly widespread, you know, it's not confined to the criminal process, and it's the reality of all serious legal proceedings. Uh, you both mentioned the importance of process, uh, and you mentioned a distinction between, uh, you know, keeping the criminal uh, prosecution language out of it. But most of these things we're talking about, you know, serious sexual assault. You're talking about rape, the the more horrific of the events that happen. Those are crimes. Why don't we use the language of that? And why isn't that a process? Why isn't the proper procedure the criminal laws that we have in place? And then the this the school can take action based on the superior fact-finding abilities of the people who do this professionally. I mean, what, why not use that process to benefit both sides? So you do have due process, and you still have the ability to get out the, the, the serious you know, civil rights violations. You know, that. I, I pretty much agree with you. Um, you know, you might, might quibble around the edges of what the colleges should do. But uh, it, I think referring it to the criminal process is the right answer. And, uh, and I think the only reason I haven't emphasized that more is that it's probably politically unrealistic. You have a Republican administration that's gonna, you know, probably going to go farther than any other administration would go down the road of protecting against false accusations. And they have not suggested, at least not yet, just referring it to the criminal process. Maybe they will before this is over. Well, let me answer that quickly by saying um, you can't only treat it as a crime. The criminal justice system is not mandatory. I was a prosecutor for many years. We're not required to do anything. We can exercise prosecutorial discretion and decline to file charges, decline to prosecute. It happens all the time. Schools are subject to mandatory federal statutes where they must act they must, this is why civil rights laws are you know, imposed on schools under the spending clause as a quid pro quo, a kind of contract deal. If you want federal money, this is what you must agree to. There's no room for discretion. You must address these civil rights matters. They are not criminal on campus. Even if they occur on campus, they are criminal in the criminal justice system. This happens all the time. If you beat somebody up in the workplace, you are prosecuted in the real world criminal justice system and you separately get in trouble under your employment 
um, rules, perhaps even civil rights laws that 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 apply um, to employment. Uh, but they are separate spheres. They serve very different purposes, and they have extremely different rules and procedures, substantively and procedurally. They're very different for good reason. Colleges should not function like the criminal justice system for a myriad of reasons. But make you know, let's be clear: if they're going to start acting like the criminal justice system, if they want to have due process, mandatory due process, it has to apply to all civil rights cases, not just violence against women. And schools don't like that. They don't want to be held to due process because that's going to increase the lawsuits they face for not complying well enough with due process. Schools deal every day with people who sell and use drugs and alcohol and steal and vandalize, and they do it very well. So this idea that they're not equipped to figure out who's telling the truth and what to do to keep their campuses safe is a bunch of nonsense. Let me just quickly repeat, that whole long statement hangs from a false premise. No federal civil rights law requires colleges to discriminate against rape accusers uh, or even to adjudicate such cases at all, except perhaps in the most unusual circumstances. And, and, and you know, there's a reason for that. Our system traditionally treats sex crimes as matters to be handled under state law by state law enforcement authorities, not by the federal government. Do we have time for one more? We should wrap up. One more? Yeah, go ahead. A uh, two-part question, and so I'll ask the first part of the question and then uh, get an answer and then ask the second part of the question. It should go fairly quickly. You mentioned, um, Professor Murphy, the uh, military. In the military, they now have the SBC program. Um, for sexual victims separate from uh, the government or the prosecutorial authority. Is that something that can be mirrored in universities, providing uh, rape victims with a, a personal representative to take them, shepherd them through the process? I, I'm having trouble hearing the question. I thought it was about the military process. I can just say very quickly that I've been involved in some military cases. They are not subject to civil rights laws at all. Um, you know, they, they, they function even separately from our um, traditional constitutional uh, mechanisms. So I know they do have some statutes that have increased some of the services they provide for victims and so forth, but they're not subject to civil rights laws at all. Colleges routinely do appoint people to shepherd rape complainants and sexual assault complainants through the campus process. It's routine. There are usually several people fulfilling that ro role. I'm, I'm not sure whether the statute requires it, but I'm fine with it. I'd like them to also provide someone to shepherd the possibly falsely accused student through the process. They don't do that ever, as far as I know. I just, just a brief comment on that. Uh, many other legal systems in their criminal processes uh, do have representation for the victim. Uh, so I'd just like to point that out. Uh, these tend to be, of course, not the adversarial systems, which are very binary. Uh, but other legal systems that are less adversarial do uh, routinely allow that. Well, thank you all for being here and to our speakers. It's wonderful to have such smart people who know so much about this issue debating. As one of our uh, students said, it's a debate that isn't often had on university campuses. Uh, Professor Murphy referenced a number of materials, including a law review article in her PowerPoint. We will make that available to everyone who provided their email at the beginning uh, when you signed in. And we also want to take, thank the Media Center for making some very last minute accommodations to have a Skype debate today that was very much appreciated. And just as a few housekeeping matters, our happy hour, which was scheduled for later this week, has been postponed. That will be uh, coming up later this month. And so you can look out for an email announcement from us. We also have two programs to tell you about, our mentorship program. We have over 100 alumni that are signed up to mentor current national members of our chapter. So sign up if you haven't already, if you'd like a mentor. And then we also have a new pro bono program for those who are interested in national security law through the Judicial Watch. You may go to Guantanamo Bay to be a designated observer 
to watch the trials of those that were accused of terrorist-related crimes on 9-11. And if you have any additional questions about that, our liaison for the program, Alex O'Hara, is in the front row. He'll be happy to answer any questions. So thank you all again for being here, and we will look forward to seeing you at our next event.